please welcome to the TEDx Sonoma County stage, Emily Scott Potrick. Good afternoon. My maternal grandparents fled the Russian pogroms. My father fled the Nazis. I would say I'm actually lucky to be alive. As a child, I grew up with the notion of those whom much is given, much is expected, and the mantra, never forget, never let it happen again. And as an adult, I continued volunteering, I started writing checks, and I joined nonprofit boards. Occasionally, I went outside of my comfort zone. I did a um, long distance bike fundraiser. You know this is a requisite to be a Northern Californian. Um, <laughs> And you heard that I wrote Tales of Devotion, which raised a lot of money for a lot of nonprofits. But nothing I did compared or prepared me for the choice that I made in 2011 to go to the Congo. So we all make choices, consciously or not, that have immense impact on our lives. I was about to change my definition of more and the meaning of more in my life in a way that I had no idea. I was on the KQED board, and I met Pat Mitchell, who was then head of PBS, and she became an incredible mentor. Pat introduced me to Eve, an amazing author, playwright, and activist, and among her many gifts, among her many gifts, Eve created V-Day, a global movement to end violence against women and girls. The UN states that one out of three women or girls um, on the planet will be a victim of sexual violence. I am one of the three. For obvious reasons, I joined this board compelled by its mission. In 2006, Eve met Dr. Dennis McGregor, a doctor, preacher, and activist who has operated on tens of thousands of women and girls at Pansy Hospital in Bukavu, Congo. And he has risked his own life to speak out against gender violence. Uh, Dr. M introduced Eve to Christine Schuler Describer, and it is not an exaggeration to say that the three of them have begun to change the world. Eve says of her first trip to the Congo, I have just returned from hell. The current Congolese war has been going on for more than 17 years, and it is estimated that somewhere between five and a half and six million people have died, half of them children making it the bloodiest conflict since World War II. And as a strategic weapon of war, over half a million females from as young as months old have been brutally raped. So much so that the UN calls the Congo the rape capital of the world. So what happened to this never let it happen again? In 2009, Christine talked to a bunch of us and said, oh, people come to the Congo, famous people, politicians. They hold our hands and they cry and they say, we will help, and then they go home and they do nothing. We are not animals in a zoo. Do not come visit and do nothing. I have to tell you, those words are tattooed in my brain. Fast forward. Vide Congo was created, and City of Joy was conceived and was starting to be built. City of Joy is a revolutionary center for the survivors of sexual violence. It is a safe haven for the physically healed women where they can continue to heal their trauma, build self-esteem and skills, and become leaders. And it is classic Vide methodology. It is designed, conceived, fulfilled, and directed by women on the ground. It opened in February 2011, and I had to go. Now, let me just tell you, for me to say that going to the rape capital of the world is outside of my comfort zone is the largest understatement I will ever say in my life, for I am literally afraid most of the time. But I really had to go. And I wrote in my journal at the time,
I close my eyes and see us dancing with hundreds of Congolese women and girls to the rhythmic beat of African music. We are arm in arm and we are smiling. I am dancing with a little girl and we are laughing. Dr. M tells us that she arrived at Pansy at the age of two. A corpse in my arms is how he describes meeting her. She and her twin were gang raped by rebels at the age of two. Her twin died. And this little one was infected with the AIDS virus. Well, my granddaughter is almost two, and another image of devastating disconnect makes its mark on my brain. I can still smell the wonderfully pungent aroma of human sweat from the hours of dancing, singing, speechifying, which is vastly different from our over-sanitized, heavily perfumed world back home. We are joyous and grateful to be in each other's company. And as I know that all of these women have been brutally raped and tortured, a dark cloud lays over this memory. And the children, these precious children, are results of the violent and vicious and predatory acts. And yet, the women are reclaiming their bodies and minds and souls. And for the umpteenth time since I arrived, I cry in despair and in hope that the world will wake up and stop the depravity. In 2012, I went back to attend the first graduation of our first cohort. These women see themselves as survivors, not as victims. They are the epitome of resiliency, and they are changing perceptions dramatically, locally and globally. And this February, I went back for One Billion Rising, and I wrote in my time, I wrote in my journal again, three cohorts of women have graduated, 90 women every six months. And there are many success stories of the graduates. As examples, one is caring for the elderly and sick. Some have opened orphanages. Some have organized cooperatives. As leaders and teachers, they're exponentially empowering Congolese women, and thus families, and thus villages. And the women say they are happy, truly happy. They feel their power. I also, on this trip, met a priest. He's working to help the children who have run away from the Lord's Resistance Army, the LRA, who had kidnapped them to become boy soldiers and sex slaves. And if you were one of the over 95 million viewers who have watched Coney 2012, you know all about the LRA. I think of this priest daily, for imagine the pain and despair that this man of God has had to witness and how he feels for him to say to us, can the special ops force that came and found and killed Osama bin Laden come and do the same to Joseph Kony? Back home, I write, Reentry to my USA life is hard, exponentially harder this time. And while my body has come back home, my head and heart have yet to make the journey. I wake up thinking about what the morning activities of City of Joy are doing. And in the dark, I worry about what the night will bring to the Congolese women and children. They taught me a French phrase far from the eyes, near to the heart. Having been to the Congo three times, relationships and bonds exist, so it is now personal. I no longer view a sea of faces. I search for the familiar faces. And certainly, to see if the little girl I danced with on my first trip is still alive. I remain incredulous 
of the women's resiliency. V-Day's mantra of turn the pain to power has manifested brilliantly. And I cannot help but ask again, where is the world? Where is the uproar? If you believe, as Eve does, that the Congo was the heart of the world, only imagine, if you heal the heart, how you heal the body instead. I get asked often, why give internationally when there's so much need domestically? Okay, so here's a reason. One quarter, less than one quarter of 1% of our national budget goes to foreign aid. We are one of the richest, most capable countries in the world. And frankly, we can do more domestically and internationally. I quote Jim Collins often, the brilliance of the and versus the tyranny of the or. If we want peace, if we think we're global citizens, we really just have to engage more. Okay, that's my brain. My heart, my heart speaks of connection and compassion. Of those who much is given, much is expected, is what I expect of myself. And I only, I only want to do more, not less. And from this, I've created a personal philosophy that I hope perhaps maybe resonates with you that you can adopt in your own lives. Adopt a philosophy of come to the conversation curious. Ask more questions, ask different questions, challenge yourself, challenge your perceptions. I have more questions than I ever thought possible and my perceptions are changing constantly. Your sweet spot, this is your personal Venn diagram. When you combine your passion with your principles and values, with the data information that you collect, that intersection is what I would say is your sweet spot for more meaningful engagement. And from there, you can create your perch. For me, a three-legged stool. The seed is resiliency. My grandparents, my father, the women of the Congo have it. Rescue animals and the people who help them have it. And former foster youths trying to get a college education have resiliency in ways that I can't begin to imagine. I am humbled by them and it's a different topic for a different day. When I was doing Tales of Devotion, I threw the term workaholic out because really what we're talking about is passionholic. A person whose passion engages one's being so completely that other pursuits pale in comparison. That's the more. That's the more. You know, we hear often that by giving, can, the benefit can help the donor versus the donee, and I don't necessarily believe that. But I will tell you, here's what I believe. When you combine your principle and your passion, you can be transformed. Frankly, if I was, anyone can be. You have so many choices. Come to them with curiosity, and you just may find more rewards than you ever thought possible. Thank you so much.